for the last 100 years, and I think it's going to be fantastic. Connacht will never be the same again since we got this here. You're okay to turn off the tailwind if you want to do it on the other one. I will uh, we'll stick with plan A for a few minutes. Okay. Okay. From Fatima to Bethlehem, from Lourdes to Kilchabak, there's never been a miracle like the airport of Benoc. To indulge in this kind of expenditure is to say the least, um, irresponsible and it should never have been started. It was, to begin with, a quite fantastic idea. Fantastic and outrageous. The idea of an ageing parish priest setting out to build a multi-million pounds airport on a County Mayo hilltop. A more unlikely jet age crossroads would be hard to imagine. But faith, they say, can move mountains. For some, faith can be a blind leap in the dark. For others, a great adventure. And back in the spring of 1981, television's prying eye scaled the muddy slopes of Borna Cúiga for the first time to catch up with the Monsignor on the eve of his quite extraordinary adventure. Monsignor Horn, what? What exactly is going on here? What do you think is going on? We're building an airport, and I hope the Department of Transport doesn't hear about it. Now, don't tell them. And we're going to have it built in a very, very short time. You see the activity that's going on here. There's another load coming now. And uh, I think it's marvelous, aren't you? Are, are you being absolutely serious about what's going on and here? We have no money. But we're hoping to get it next week or the week after. You, you, <laughs> you don't really have permission, and you well, don't have money. I'm not sure whether I have permission or not. But, I mean, I'm going ahead anyhow, just taking a chance. Connacht, long the Cinderella of provinces, was going to have an airport, whether governments ordained it or not. And this was where it was going to be built. The odds against it happening were phenomenal. But then they were scarcely any greater than that one day, just 12 miles down the road, a papal helicopter would drop out of a clear blue East Mayo sky. The effect was electric. The dramatic visit, a personal triumph for the village's parish priest. And the outpouring of faith and devotion by half a million pilgrims finally convinced the Monsignor of something he already knew. We needed an airport here uh, to bring pilgrims in. It's very difficult to bring uh, the sick and the old and the handicapped uh, on buses or on trains. But if, if they could come fly in, then that would be much, much easier because we could get them from the airport to Knock very easily. Images of desolation and abandonment had for long fueled a dark mood of resentment in the west of Ireland. And rightly or wrongly, the politicians and the central planners were tarred with the brush of official neglect and indifference. In the West, there were many who placed more faith in lighted candles than in political promises. Others already knew where the penny could be found for the candle or the basilica or even an airport. There are people over in London and Manchester and Bristol and dying to come back here, but it's, 
and the only reason why they're not coming is because it's too difficult to get here. There's too much hardship. It takes them two or, days, two or three days to come and two or three days to go back, and they have only a day here. Whereas if they could get into an airplane in London or Bristol or Birmingham, they're over here in less than an hour, and they're uh, from the airport to Knock Shrine in, in, in 20 minutes. If it's too hard to get here from, get from Dublin to Connacht or from London to Connacht, then business people are not going to come. Uh, the owners of hotels are not going to travel down from Dublin to see their hotels and it takes them too long. It's too tedious and the roads are bad. And uh, if you look around the roads here, I'm sure you have travelled around, you'll find that we have the worst roads in Ireland. And they've closed the railway between Shannon and uh, Sligo. And uh, they're talking about closing the road now from uh, Dublin to Westport. Well, if they close that, they might as well build... The railway, you mean? The railway, yes. Uh, they might as well build a wall around Connacht and, and turn it into a bird sanctuary or something like that. But uh, we need a, an airport down here, and the sooner we get it, the better. Jesus, help me to love you daily more and more. And so the parish priest of Knock set off on a journey that would in time make him something of a folk hero. With the groundswell of public opinion now running his way, he first armed himself with a specially commissioned viability study from a team of international experts. The study gave the project its first green light. Opponents would subsequently say it was merely an amber glow. The major constraint is that there would have to be uh, a commitment to provide an air link to London because the sole justification for this airport rested on the provision of a direct link between Connacht and London. The remaining critical element in which uh, our conclusion rested on was that it would be necessary to have agreement on acceptable part-time working practices in order to be able to make the airport run on a relatively self-sustaining basis. Charlestown was the favoured location, something of a crossroads for Connacht, but a very thinly populated crossroads indeed. The May 1980 report saw it as a gateway to the west and northwest, straddling the main arterial routes. But what the study didn't really face up to was whether or not the country needed or could afford a fourth international airport. In government, Charles Hawhey's front bench had many preoccupations, political and economic. Knock Airport was scarcely on the agenda. West Mayo's Porrick Flynn, junior minister at the Department of Transport and Power, was, however, perfectly placed to influence events. But far from Leinster House, tragic events were, in their own way, going to be forever linked with the unfolding airport saga. The funerals of two Garthi shot dead after a Balhadarine bank robbery took place at the Basilica. And afterwards, the Taoiseach and the Monsignor were to have a fateful lunchtime encounter. John Healy reported sometime in the Irish Times that Charles Jahai dined with me here on the occasion. And uh, that it was the costliest lunch that he ever had, that it cost him an airport. I invited all the politicians of every colour and every uh, creed uh, to lunch on the occasion. Gareth Fitzgerald couldn't wait because he, but he came in and had some refreshments and he went ahead to go to Brussels. Charles G. High was, was a teacher at the time. But Liam Cosgrove was there and Jack Lynch and all, all senior politicians. And I made a speech after the dinner and I mentioned the airport and I mentioned our expectations. And Charles G. High got up and he said, well, you know, he said, I'm very sympathetic, he said, towards this project. He said, and uh, he said, perhaps you're pushing an open door. And uh, I took that to mean that he was very sympathetic and that probably we would get an airport. And Jack Lynch across the way said, well, now, Monsignor, be very careful. That's not a commitment. And I said, if it's not a commitment, Jack, is it the best we have got yet, you know? The Minister of State for Transport, Porrick Flynn, has announced approval in principle for the development of an airport in County Mayo. Mr Flynn made the announcement after meeting a deputation led by Monsignor James P. Horan, parish priest of Knock. 
it was made quite clear when the approval in principle was given that further studies would be undertaken to determine the length of the runway and the facility to be provided and the installations and whatever. And nobody was given to understand that there was an automatic approval forthcoming subsequent to my uh, in principle approval. Well, at that stage, there was only a pr approval in principle for, I mean, it could be any size of an airport at that point in time. You know, I mean, if you want to, to take the, the approval in principle, it's basically for, for an airport. Now, you could uh, construe at that point in time, anybody could construe, well, you know, what size is it going to be? Is it going to be an airstrip? Is it going to be a, um, a thermic atom strip or what? So it was basically approval to... Uh, to a project that, you know, would go ahead, the size of which had not been determined at that point in time. And that uh, meant to me that we were now going to get an airport capable of uh, accommodating aircraft, medium-sized aircraft of the type of Boeing 737, because I knew that no other type of aircraft would be suitable for that uh, job. The decision was made in breach of all technical advice available to the department. And in fact, the day the meeting uh, took place in the department, uh, it, it had all been set up to advise the, uh, the delegation from Mayo that this project wouldn't uh, be going ahead. And that was changed in the last half hour at political level. So it was very much a political decision in, uh, against all the advice. Just Three days later, Charles J. Hawley was back in his hometown to be fated. But when political debts are incurred, there's usually a price to be paid. And this time, it was the Monsignor who was pulling the strings. Monsignor Horn, ladies and gentlemen, a car de galera, Vinius de galera. I am deeply conscious of the honor done to me today by the people of the town where I was born. For all the charm and Consummate political one-upmanship or outrageous self-aggrandizement, the argument over the famous Castlebar plaque still goes on. Many saw this as a three-day-old debt already being repaid. And so, as 1980 gave way to 81, came the boldest move of all. With little more than a political nod and a wink, the airport team swung into action. We want to bring Connacht into the scene, the 1980s. Um, we're building a 7,500 foot runway, basically 150 feet wide, with a bearing strength sufficient to, to cater for a 737 or, that's, or such a type of aircraft. This is very important, as you well imagine. Uh, we propose to have the runway lit so that we can have after, after sun, sunrise, sunset uh, operations. Employment will not come easily. New industries will not come easily. And it takes something like an airport that provides that quick, comfortable means of communication. To, it takes something like this to uh, prime the area. And it takes something like this to help to sell the area to people from abroad and people who would invest in new industries. But even then, the Western voice of dissent was also being heard. I suppose one would have to uh, commend the people who thought of it, but one would suggest that in the present economic climate that the money they're proposing to spend on it might just be a little bit better well spent. What, what would you like to see, or rather on what would you like to see this money being spent? Well, one would look upon an airport as uh, an improvement of the infrastructure of an area, and one would think that the roads could do with vast improvement in this area to the betterment of a greater portion of the community than perhaps those who could afford to fly. If you want to scoop the pool, though, you must play for high stakes. By now, half a million pounds of hard cash had already been wagered up front. But the promoters had gambled correctly on Fianna Foyle coming up trumps and bankrolling their game. If you were waiting for financial commitment and waiting for permission, we might be waiting here for the next 20 years. I might be dead. I, I'm an, an old man in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and by now, there was no doubt at all about who was calling the tune and who would pay the piper.
It was an ebullient Albert Reynolds who turned the first symbolic sod, digging into the red-brown earth of a Mayo hillside and the far more unyielding pockets of the nation's taxpayers. It was a shovelful of soil which would commit successive governments to £9 million of state funding. Afterwards, he vowed he'd be the man to usher Connacht into the jet age. The airport will also allow the rapid movement of freight, especially, especially perishable goods such as mariculture and high-value consumer products, and will give easy access to the area to firms engaged in the exploration for oil, gas or minerals. I'm absolutely delighted and I'm very pleased the government made this decision. I think it's the right decision because it's going to be a great airport. It's going to be one of the most scenic and most panoramic in Europe. And uh, standing here, I can see thousands and thousands of pilgrims and tourists coming here to this airport. I can see a huge, great industrial estate rising from the bogs here in the middle of Mayo. Three elections in three half years would rattle the steady progress of the airport project. June 81 saw Charlie Hawhey make a dash to the country, but what could have been crisis number one for the airport was averted by the firmness of the Fianna Fáil commitment. We don't want any area of this country to be left behind. We don't want any region to be neglected. We want the whole country to move forward together. We want economic and social progress to be equally divided. And Fianna Foyle's enthusiasm for the airport was more than matched by early Fine Gael endorsement. I announced yesterday the, the provision of an international sports complex and leisure centre to be sited at the uh, adjacent to the airport site between Charlestown and Kilkelly. And then, suddenly, in from the cold and back in power, a new coalition found an airport promised but far from paid for. Yet, honour the deal they would. Back at government buildings, however, there would be the first real signs of coalition disapproval and ominous warnings of much worse to follow. Uh, we should uh, revise the whole project. Uh, I have submitted uh, to the Taoiseach way back in the end of September that no further exchequer monies should be paid to the promoters, that the whole project should be reviewed. And, of course, there are options now. One can cancel the whole thing as a, an unfortunate escapade in Irish political uh, opportunism, looking for votes, which is what the whole thing was all about in the first instance, by the last government, uh, and um, write off the £2 million which is already spent. It would cost another million pounds or so to write it off. Or one can go ahead and have a, a smaller airport of about 4,000 feet. That would cost the best part of £6 million. Pounds. Uh, you know, and that too would be uneconomic, but at least it wouldn't be as daft, to use that phrase, uh, as the expenditure of £20 million. Pounds. But by now, the project was well and truly airborne, and some were even daring enough to attempt a bumpy touchdown with the giant earth movers still hulking in the background. In the chill days before Christmas 81, however, the coalition would bow to mounting public and media pressure and call a halt to government support. Well, I'm not angry. I'm disappointed. And I'm saddened, I think, for the people of the West, because I think this was a marvellous opportunity for them, you see, to build up the infrastructure needed to bring the employment, to bring the tourists, and to raise the standard of living in this particular area. They need it very badly. And once again, old Fianna Foyle friends trooped to knock to lend their support. I don't have to spell out, indeed, the utter shock and dismay that, that uh, we greeted this, this uh, government decision yesterday evening because we see it as a symbol of a betrayal, a total betrayal of the, to of the West and the Western region. We intend to make sure that there is not a half-white elephant, as been used, left on top of a mountain. We intend to finish it, even without the government. Is there a danger, as you see it, of the project being abandoned completely? There, there is every danger of it. I think this is only the first step. The government now have taken the first step and they will continue with this. We will not let them do this. We intend to press it forward as and from next week with every form of protest at our disposal. If some people are inclined to say, 
But in politics, as in airport building, governments can be wrong-footed too. And the price of a child's pair of shoes saw the coalition ignominiously booted out of office on Budget Day 82. Once again, the airport was a political football and the promises followed fast on the TD's heels. Connaught Regional Airport is capital. Connaught Regional Airport is capital expenditure and it is justifiable uh, expenditure in my view. It is an additional important addition to the infrastructure and transport of that region and fully justifiable and in particular because four and a half to five million is already committed on it I believe that the sensible economic thing to know to do now is to complete it and as election chased election in a cart wheeling nine months Charlie was in again Gregory deal time and then back out again but not before another airport check would be signed Back at the airport, the vigilant eyes of the army saw Jellignite and not Faith move mountains. The eyes of the world watched the struggle between the priest and the politicians. His name is James Horan, age 70. Monsignor Horan, parish priest of the village of Nock in the province of Connacht. Using a combination of guile, blarney and faith, he has managed to get help for the village from tight-fisted authorities. One bishop, an admirer, calls him a pious old rogue. God bless your reckoning to knock. But for years he had one wish, one idea he thought would put knock on the map, an airport. Of all things, an international airport that would bring in pilgrims with money and industry with jobs. An unlikely idea for a place as backward, poor, and underpopulated as knock is. No government in its right mind would lay out the millions necessary. But of course, if the right moment comes along, it doesn't hurt to ask. It came when the then Prime Minister, Charles Hockey, came to the nearby town of Castle Bar to unveil a plaque to himself on the house where he was born. It was the perfect moment. The simple country priest asked the wise Prime Minister, would you be giving us an airport at Knock? No better place for it, said the Prime Minister. The simple country priest did not say international airport, and he did not say 7,500 foot runway. The prime minister thought grass strip for the rich and pious plane owner. And voila. Before you could say apparition, there was an airport, a building. Monsignor Horan formed a company, himself as chairman, and with a lot of prayer and promises, he convinced construction companies to start work, told them the money was coming from Dublin. To Dublin, it was an apparition and not a pleasant one. The country priest had led the government of Ireland, nearly bankrupt itself, into a $20 million project that virtually no one in the government wanted. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Hockey was beaten in the election and the new government lacked the courage, or perhaps the legal right, to go back on his rather vague commitment. Did you describe in detail the sort of airport? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have sufficient knowledge of airports to be able to describe in detail <laughs> anything about them. I have been learning since about them, you know. And <laughs> uh, if he were spoke to me now, I'd be able to tell him exactly what I needed. You know. <laughs> he said to me, he said, "Look, he said, do you realise how important this program is? How prestigious it is?" I said, "I don't." Well, he said, "Do you know what?" 30 seconds on this program would cost a person, a commercial man who wants to advertise. I said, I don't. He said, $340,000. So if we got 20 minutes, it would, it would be worth uh, 13 or $14 million. Of course, I prefer to have got the $13 million to finish the airport and have done with it. Is it a sin to fudge the truth sometimes for the greater good? in trying to get that airport to, 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 to fudge about the truth. I don't want to use the word lie. Oh, I never fudge about the truth. The truth is always comes out on top. I'll tell you where you fudge the truth sometimes. Yes. <laughs> when you say, I'm just a simple country, <laughs> unsophisticated <laughs> country priest. Well, I, I can, I can uh, work for airports and still be very simply, simple, unsophisticated <laughs> country priest. <laughs> <laughs> the outside world might be bewildered by it all. Back at home, Jim Mitchell had other words for it. Well, the estimated finishing cost of Knock Airport is in excess of 13 million pounds, which is more than 10 times the cost of Galway Airport. 
and we could have got 10 local airports for the price of what uh, of uh, knock and that was done in in uh, in uh, despite the fact that all expert advice was against it all expert advice uh, knock airport is n is distant f from any town of any size it's on a high in a high position on a, a foggy and boggy hill and certainly it hasn't been well placed so I, I think it has to be said a, a, a serious mistake was made we're going ahead now because we're fed up with the government's attitude towards the airport they have sent us several letters saying that they there's no more money from the exchequer uh, mr mitchell made his foggy boggy speech in, in galway as you know and he said not even one penny Pennies from heaven, perhaps not quite, but a worldwide fundraising drive as the cash-starved airport battled on. £1,400, this hasn't been counted into Lovely. We Very launched nice. an appeal through on post, and we sent uh, an appeal to every householder in Ireland with the exception of Dublin and Waterford. And the only reason why we didn't send them to Dublin and Waterford is because on post had no... Uh, means of distributing on these areas and uh, it has been very successful it's been fantastic the money has been pouring in ever ever since uh, from ordinary people all over the country not merely from Connacht but even much more from across the across the Shannon we had uh, we have for Cork and Kerry and Waterford and Louth and Manor you name it and from Northern Ireland and from across the seas uh, we've been on uh, telephone each night, which... Uh... Typical of the volunteer fundraising teams, the Donohues from Charlestown flew to the U.S. and coast to coast raised money for their airport. One or two contacts, prime contacts, in each city. Uh, they have been very anxious to help us, and they are setting up radio shows and television shows for us when we go out. And the dollars and the dimes rolled in. Well, we, we raised over £700,000, and we raised that in three or four months, and the money is still coming in, actually. We're still getting a, a substantial amount of money from, for the airport. But then we decided that the government had abandoned it. The government didn't even appoint a caretaker. They didn't even fence it in. They didn't mind what happened to it. And we said, we went to the government, and we met the, um, the minister in September. And we said to him, look, you've abandoned the airport. Why not give it to us? and we'll finish the airport on, on conditions. And the condition being that they hand it over to us as it is. Secondly, that we would get a, a duty-free zone around the airport. Also, that we would have permission to uh, invite equity, to, get, to invite investment for the airport. And that we would get a license to correspond with the standard of, of, of work that was reached at the airport. The government has decided that we should withdraw uh, from the project uh, and just retain a contingent interest in it for about 20 years. Um, Why did the government decide this after having spent the 10 million, which is at least three quarters, 80% of the total costs? Why withdraw at this stage? Because uh, of our judgment that further money w wasn't justified on this project, that this is going to be a very uh, serious loss-making project for the, for the future. That it's not just a matter of completing the project, it would then, uh, we uh, believe, give rise to calls for subsidisation. It would certainly, uh, it's certainly not going to be a viable proposition in our view. So this is where the, um, this is where the government money stops here, basically. That's right, that's where they lost heart. And uh, there's 2,100 feet down there, and 300 feet of a runoff. But Mayo, Griffiths, and Exile Dollars would see the half white elephant turn jet age jumbo. There'd be no talk now of many airports as government might have wished. This would be Connock's gateway to the world, and 84 and 85 saw the impossible dream become a reality. To the nine million pounds the state had given, the people added three more. And the runway and the legend grew apace as the thoughts of the humble parish priest of Knock turned to opening day. I'm dreaming of 
of a great airport with all the politicians that I know. May the Taoiseach be happy and bright and may all the politicians do right. Daybreak in the little village of Nock, and in a very real sense, the dawning of a new era for the West. In just a few hours, this quiet corner of County Mayo would suddenly be thrust into the jet age. It would be one of aviation history's most colourful chapters and a quite amazing folk gathering. About four men like him, and it'd be the richest part in the world, Connacht would be. And I'm delighted. It's the best day of my life in all my travels. I'm Tar, good morning. This is the Shamrock 4962. We're passing 7,000 feet for 4,000 feet at 1031. Shamrock 4962, uh, Connacht Tar, good morning. Uh, you're welcome. Glenn and Maddie. No, Elfin. 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 Oh, that's great. <laughs> Congratulations, Martin. You're home you. and from Tullamore. From Tullamore. Good girl. Good girl. Congratulations, Martin. You're from Arsley. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, Martin. Thank you. What are your feelings as, as the pilgrims begin to arrive, Martin? Oh, this marvellous. I mean, I can't, words can't describe how I feel. Yes. Uh, I am proud of them all and I'm proud of the. Uh, people who have backed me and helped me to finish the, the airport. I'm uh, proud of all the people who gave me the airport in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, in spite of the begrudgers. <laughs> well, uh, you know, God bless them too. <laughs> Connacht Airport announces the arrival of Aer Lingus Flight 4966 from Dublin. Thank you. Well, I, I think it's marvellous. Uh, I find it very hard to, you know, realise it has, has happened. But I look forward to it. But at times, of course, suppose there may have been doubts, but uh, it's here now and uh, I'm delighted. I hope it brings great prosperity to the good people here in Connacht. The credit goes to the good, the ordinary people of Ireland who helped me to finish the airport by giving their subscriptions. It's due to the people who uh, work voluntarily, you know, for nothing really, uh, to, in order to finish it. I think it's, it's a marvellous day and I'm, I'm proud of it. Straight 
West of Wakes, thanks to Monsignor. My compliments and a nice run. I've been on the first flight to arrive in Knock. Did you ever think um, when you were growing up in Mayo that you would one day fly into an airport in Knock? Never. <laughs> Never for one moment. It's great. It's here now in the middle of Connacht and I hope that they make good use of it, that it brings employment for the young people who are leaving school, for the unemployed and so on. I hope that it brings prosperity to the whole province. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> here in Charlestown. So I think it's important that we have a representative. And I think it's a wonderful day for Connacht and for Charlestown and for Knock and Kilkelly and all the sort of Mayo, the whole Connacht region. I hope you enjoy your flight now. And thank you very much. Can you tell me why did you decide to come on this flight? Well, I, I've been involved in trying to raise funds for this airport for the last three or four years. And uh, I think there's an example set here for the whole of Ireland, that the people of Ireland must and particularly the people of the West of Ireland, must really get things done for themselves. We mustn't be depending on the people in Dublin to show us what we can do. We must do things for ourselves. And this is the reason I want to support this, and I want to say it's the best thing that has happened in the West of Ireland for a hundred years since, since the apparition at Knock. And I think that it's going to be an inspiration to the, all, all the West of Ireland to really get things done for ourselves. And I think that's the message from here. <laughs> What kind of thoughts are going through your mind just now? Well, uh, I'm looking into the future and I see thousands and thousands of people uh, coming here, thousands of planes <coughs> landing here that will bring prosperity to this part of the country. We never got a chance really until now, and now that we have uh, the proper infrastructure, <coughs> I'm sure that the people of the West will take advantage of it, and uh, it will lead on to very, very big things indeed for this area. Well, the, the St. Union down there is just turning at the end of that 7,500 feet now, uh, you can see the lights flashing there. It's, it's obviously an extraordinarily moving moment for you. It is. Well, all the saints, all the Irish saints in heaven will be praying for us now, and all the Irish saints in, <laughs> <laughs> and, and all the Irish saints will help us to bring it, bring it the full circle, and that we will really get get a lot of uh, uh, support for.
15 years ago, there was a list prepared in Knock, and I remember the three of the things that was on that list, and one of them was the Pope to come to Knock, a new basilica for Knock, and an airport. And a lot of people said at that time that was impossible. Today, chin of the, I've checked it with different people who say today, this years and years longer than me here at Stewart and at Knock, and all of those have been realised today. The planes are taken off, and everything has happened that was on that list 15 years ago all due to one man and a lot of hard work. I do believe that he will come here and that he'll kiss the ground here at Barnalyra. <laughs> to um, Padre Pio's in San Giovanni, we were in uh, Loreto, we were in Assisi, we met the Pope, we were all over, 2,000 miles, two flights and a great week. We prayed by day and we danced by night and today we're back in County Mayo, a great week. It's almost like the day we expected Pope John. I was there, the same coming as well, at Knock. Yes. And it was wonderful. It's wonderful today, really, for Mayo. For Monsignor Horn, it's his airport. We had the Blessed Virgin here, Bo James, he did declare. And Pope John Paul the Twenty Third appeared just over there. Now do you mean to tell me, he said in total shock, that I am not entitled to an airport here to knock. TDs were lobbied and harassed with talk of promised votes. And people who'd been loyal for years all spoke to change in coats. Eternal damnation was threatened on the flock Who said it was a bar to fill the near phones up and up Now everyone was happy, the miracle is complete 
Father Horton's got his runway, it's 18,000 feet. All sorts of planes could land there, of that there's little doubt. And we heard the Yankees to keep the Russians out. From Fatty Matt to Bethlehem, from Lourdes to Kilchamuck. There's never been a miracle like the airport of the knocker. Idealism, ingenuity, and more than a little arm twisting had made it all possible. But now, more bold decisions would have to be taken. Arianta, the National Airports Authority, had said no to Connacht Regional, our first non state owned airport. So, British expertise was brought in to do the job. Um, I've been in aviation 25 years now, and I've never been at an airport in my life where the enthusiasm and the dedication of the people around it make any problem seem surmountable. Yes, we'll make the deadline. It's going to be tight, but we'll make the deadline. Right, crew, tension! Right, crew, next time we'll do the same crew again. And I want to see it a lot smarter. The engineering feats have been incredible. I understand from the consultant engineers, for example, that in the nine stages of construction, every stage has been brought in at or under budget, which in modern terms is incredible, and that's the 1981 prices. The actual engineering feat itself is quite tremendous. I mean, this is not just a flat top of a hill. It was a sloping hill. It's now virtually flat, 8,200 feet of the most magnificent runway in Europe, and that doesn't come from me alone, it comes from the British Airports Authority airport designer. A critical path point for um, grant of the license. And not only would NOC have an international airport, it would also have its own independent airline. Yet another milestone, this one the brainchild of an ex Aer Lingus pilot. Its immediate horizon, the UK market. We'll be offering as of mid June on start up, uh, assuming that everything goes to plan according to our. Uh, our route license applications that uh, we would commence service initially with about uh, a daily flight to Stansted, three times a week to Manchester, three times to Birmingham, and once each to Glasgow and Leeds. Sister, what, what do you think of the airport? Come here, come back. <laughs> She's shy, sister is shy. And it has been another memorable week. Licensed on Monday afternoon. The passenger fares were already rolling in by Tuesday morning, and this time it was all for real. But still, as ever, there would be the whiff of controversy, and Charles J. Hawhey would once again be the man for the last hurrah. Well, I don't apologise to anybody for that. I think that uh, Charles J. Hawhey is uh, a Mayo man. He was born in Castlebar. I unveiled a plaque to him down in Castlebar. He's a Connacht man. And I think that he has the interests of the people of the West at heart. I'm not saying that other politicians haven't got the interests of West, West of Ireland at heart, but he's prepared to do something. And he was, he, we wouldn't have this airport only for him. And what a last hurrah it would be this afternoon, in spite of the wind and the rain and the setbacks. Aircraft might have to be redirected, Celtic Air's plans delayed, and just about everybody soaked to the skin. But it would, nevertheless, long be remembered as the day of the men from County Mayo, the priest and the politician. Of Monsignor Horn himself personally, and with one flick of this scissors, I will declare this airport officially open. In all the controversy and in all the name calling, Charles Jehai's faith in this project never wavered. And once again, the world would look with disbelief 
at a Mayo hilltop where men had stood and made things happen as few before them had ever done and as fewer still would be likely to do in the jet age days ahead. What way will you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as a good, kind, honest parish priest who did his best both in spiritual things and in the temporal things for his people everywhere he walked. I want no more than that. Anybody that's realistic will know that when you depart this life, you might be remembered for six months, but in five years, or some other body will have stepped into the breach and be carrying on the walk that you carried on. And I hope that that will be true in my case as well.